And we are live with episode 134 of the Start, Build, Grow Show. Man, what is up, everybody? Hey, guys, I know we weren't live last Wednesday. Randy and I actually were at the American Contractor Summit in Indianapolis. It was unbelievable. One of the first you know, completely virtual conference in the space, 12 speakers. It was awesome. We got a lot of great networking in there. But for last week's episode, if you guys haven't checked it out, we did upload the eight-figure panel. So there was a bunch of CEOs who hit that eight-figure mark. We took that that um, the panel. We actually uploaded it as a podcast format for you guys to check out. So make sure you do that. But Randy Brothers, my friend, what's going on? How we doing? What is up, everybody? Welcome, welcome back. We're excited to be back. Last week was awesome. It was definitely a new experience having to, you know, get up on stage and speak as if you're speaking to a crowd of people with like a couple cameras and like two or three people in the background. So it was a different little <laughs> mental challenge, but uh, all in all, man, John and his team at the American Contractor Show, the American Contractor Summit, uh, they they did an awesome job. And I'm excited because they're gonna be doing another one every quarter. Uh, so I'm excited to be a part of it. If you did miss that and you didn't get to watch it live, you can always check it out uh, either at the AmericanContractorSummit.com or check out their Facebook page and you can still get access to all the content you know, there was 12 of probably the most influential, some of the most influential speakers, coaches, you know, influencers, experienced professionals in the roofing business, all in on one stage within a 24 hour period. Uh, so much content, so much value. It was a lot of fun. Mm hmm. You know, without further ado, with further ado, we got our <laughs> further ado. We we get we got Mr. Crest Hustle himself here. Right. We got Sam's brothers with Crest Exteriors. Sam, what's going on, man? How you doing? Man, I'm doing great. Um, happy to happy to be here. Um, mm -hmm. Happy to talk about roofing. I can talk about roofing all day, any day. So mm -hmm. um, it's obviously our passion. That's what we're. Um, that's what that hustle. I'm gonna take my jacket off. Yeah, like it's man. Hot it's get, it's, it's um, getting hot. We got him in the hot brother. seat. We got him in the hot yeah. seat over here. We got Sam Shothers in the hot seat. It's getting hot in here. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm doing great. Uh, we're, we're excited to kick off 2021. We're still rolling from the hurricanes. I love uh, the second half storms, the hurricane storms, because they do roll you through the winter months. Um, we get locked and loaded. We didn't have to downsize too much for, for hail season. We're going to have a full sales staff mm -hmm. uh, ready, ready to rock as a hailstorm now. Mm -hmm. So we're going to give away some of these secrets, man. So for those of you who don't know, right, uh, as Sam grew uh, Crest Exteriors to $34 million in annual sales, you know, that put him on 48th on the, the top 100 roofing contractor list. Obviously, he's got a lot of secret sauce that you guys can take away from this show, implement in your business, and we're going to dive in it. But you, we like to start with the story, right? Because, you know, people see you all over the place in the roofing space at different conferences online, you name it. But, you know, how did Sam Struthers get into the roofing space? What's your background? All right. Um, my background is adjusting, um, which I guess we're, we're mainly a, a restoration roofing company. I think most uh, people at these conferences are there. There's a handful of retail roofers, uh, but the, on the restoration side, adjusting translates to roofing pretty well. Um, I got into adjusting at a young age. My dad got into it, got me into adjusting in high school. I was 15, 16 years old, climbing, doing rope and harness claims for State Farm. Um, they didn't know I was doing them for them. Right? I was out of all the photos. Um, holding, holding my dad up. Um, got into got into chasing storms for pilot catastrophe. Did that for I was a licensed adjuster for 14 years um, and worked all over the country. Worked every hurricane since 1998, um, either as a contractor or as a pub or as an adjuster. So I've been in the industry quite a long time. I started Crest five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, started in this building here. In fact, Suite Two down there. We're still in like a strip. We're in an industrial park, but. I rented a, uh, rented a, I think it's 800 square foot office. I mean, the office, the whole office was the size of this, my office now, um, with a small warehouse with the intention on, on getting bigger on scale mm -hmm. on day one. That was the intention. Um, I gapped adjusting to, to roofing actually with a, I worked for a company called town and country roofing. They're local here in Dallas. I worked for them for 16 months. Uh, my first time selling roofs and I sold, uh, $3.6 million on my own um, with town and country, just door knocking, just 
spit knowledge on insurance, right? Just there's different sales techniques. I think some guys are real personal. Some guys are this. I had knowledge of roofing. I had knowledge of the insurance process. And that was my pitch. Mm -hmm. uh, I was good at teaching people. I taught people as adjuster. I taught uh, people how to be adjusters. My last storm, I was a trainer. I trained people how to do that. Once I learned success in the roofing space, I wanted to teach uh, my friends and share, share the experience with other people on how, how you can be successful in this industry with no education. Uh, with a bad history, doesn't matter what your history is, you can change that. And that was my goal, was to spread the knowledge and teach people uh, how to make their life better through roofing. Um, and it's it's that passion that got me to scale better. It was literally the intention of choosing to make others and teach others this this industry. In my, I mean, in my opinion, that was that was the whole motivation behind it. Mm -hmm. I started I started day one. Um, me, I hired an office manager and rented an office before I sold a roof. We had a start date of, I told my last company, hey, in four months, I'm leaving. I'm starting in here. Don't give me any more leads. I want to leave with integrity. And I'm starting, I'm going to have my own office. And I had a hired office manager in that four months, developed a brand and opened the doors. And since day one, I've um, I've paid a commission on every single roof. So if I sell a job, I take a sales guy with me. Mm -hmm. But anyways, that's how Chris started. Cool, man. I love it. Now, okay, so... Was there any any hiccups in the in the beginning? I mean, was it was it smooth sailing? Like, tell us what, how, how the, the you know the first yeah. year or so went for you. Yeah, so well, town country was probably one of the best experiences. Learning um, some of the processes from him from them, they were uh, archaic in some of their design. They used manila folders. They had no CRM. They had no process of the process of tracking dollars was writ, right, written on a on a manila folder, and I learned pretty quickly. Um, right, right after we started, um, to scale as, as I got to, you know, in the first four months I had five sales reps in the first six months I had 30 sales reps. I started realizing manila folders were everywhere and that wasn't going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, we started August 1st by, by April. I had AccuLinks, um, up and running. I had a full system in place. Uh, the, the process of switching was kind of difficult. Uh, we weren't using a large enough version of an accounting software by the end of that year. So then we had to switch accounting softwares. We didn't, technology-wise, we didn't, while, while our game plan was to scale, I wasn't set to scale from the get-go. And I had to transfer data, not only from the Manila folders to the AccuLinks, but at the end of that year, I had to switch from what we, we called WinTAC to QuickBooks. And the migration of the accounting data was just as big a problem because it wasn't prepared to scale. Nowadays, we're, you know, our, our systems and our processes are in place. I think that's one big takeaway. There's, there's a million other lessons to learn in the roof. Yeah, you learn a, you learn a new lesson every day. I think Paul Rico, it, Paul that Rico, never Rico. changes, right? You know, I'm I'm ten years in, and every like January, like we were talking about, like right now, it's like, all right, what's broken, and what can we do to improve it? You know, and, and or what can I break? What process is we may have a process for something, but as you grow, things change, technology changes, people change. You have to constantly evaluate where you are evaluate your processes and come up with new ones and or ways to improve them that's just accept it right it's part of the journey it's part of the part of the deal yeah 100%. Mm. So, okay, i will i will both you guys answer this one so you know randy i'll even let you go first and then then sam you can jump in here advice for the people just getting going they just got going they just got their llc and they're ready to rock and roll and they're about to take over the world because they could do it better than the last company they worked for what tips do we got let's say let's go with randy <laughs> well the first one is look at my man's hat because if you don't have hustle <laughs> Good luck. Because the first year, the first six months, the first couple of years, there's like a rite of passage. You know, when you're diving in as an entrepreneur and as a leader for a CEO, you go from, you know, on a roof or selling roofs or an adjuster. I have the same background. You are now a CEO. You got to figure it out. Like you have to embrace your, your role as a CEO. But the first piece is hustle. You just got to be willing to do anything and everything and do whatever it takes to get jobs on the board, to get the ball rolling, to get the cash flowing. And once you do that, you want to be able to have a plan in place to start shifting to implementing hiring people and implementing process. Like the faster you can make that transition and have that plan to execute, the faster you'll be able to build a scalable model. And that that's the key is you got to be able to make that transition. And I think a lot of people struggle there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. I 
I agree. That's one of the hardest transitions because you can't, you don't have processes are worthless without sales, right? But and everyone gets in this because they think they're a great salesman. Well, you're not going to be able to, you, it's difficult to be the top salesman and be the CEO, right? You can't do both and scale. You can stay five to $10 million. You can do and, and still be involved in every sale and be, you know, cherry picking leads, but be prepared to, to lead men and to, to, to not be the top sales rep and to give your leads away. And, um, and everyone thinks they're going to get into it and get rich. It, mine was the opposite. I was rich when I started it and I got broke real quick. <laughs> yep. um, we did, we had, I, I started with almost a million dollars and then the first year ran through just cash. I mean, we, we did almost 13 million. We had 12 and a half million um, our first year in business. And you don't realize the AR that you're going to need. It took me two years to take a paycheck out of Crest um, just because we scaled so fast. Our second year, we did $20 million. It sounds like a lot of money, but you've got to have, it takes so much money to produce that and to, to mm -hmm. carry the AR to, to be ready and make sure you have either yep. credit lines in place, you have plans to scale because doing more business doesn't mean you're making more money out of the box, right? You're making money accrual, but you're not making money cash because you're not always depositing it, especially in the restoration world. We, we see, you know, a 45 day turn cycle on our money. If we're doing, you know, at $30 million, you're doing $3 million a month. Well, if it takes 45 days turn on average, you got four and a half million tied up in AR at all times. It, it, that's a lot of money. To, and if you don't make your payments, if you don't make one payroll, if you don't pay one sub one time, you don't pay one supplier, you got blood in the water, all the processes in the world aren't going to save you. You need yeah, to make yeah. sure you're, you're ready to scale, that you're financially prepared to scale. It's not for everyone gets in this and thinks it's just a magic bean. As soon as you sell a bunch of stuff, you're going to be rich. But mm -hmm. sometimes it takes it takes planning. It takes um accounting it takes it takes all the all the hats like like randy said you've got to be prepared to hustle you got to be prepared to learn i i had an accounting degree but i hadn't used it right i was an adjuster i wasn't i, I mean i was i was measuring roofs so i had to relearn how to do accounting how to relearn every every trick i had to learn how to do marketing i had to learn facebook right that was when facebook was kind of coming out but the whole process was fun it's just a hustle you got to be willing to become an expert at it and hand it off and know mm. that your person's not going to do it as well as you and be okay with that. Mm -hmm. Well, on the, on the flip side, too, is you can shift that mindset there, my man, is is look for people that can do better than you. Sure, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if, and not necessarily everything, but you got to understand what your main strength is, right? What's your number one strength, contributing strength to the company? Put, your, put a goal to put yourself in that role find people who are better than you at everything else yeah and that's no, no. that's how you you're, do you're it. correct I, <laughs> uh, no on the digital side like year one we had a, i mean we had i can't even turn the camera on these guys said we got a green room in the back they i mean we have a full videography team that was that was running everything we did i mean obviously i hired people that were smarter than me on on the digital side. Oh, yeah. um mm -hmm. uh, same thing with our supplementer she's the one that, the one that runs my supplementing department uh trained my dad to be an adjuster She's just, they were sick of traveling, sick of doing all that. We figured a way to centralize it here in, here in Plano. And we've got a supplement department with 40 years experience in insurance adjusting. Um, so she's, she's amazing. So yeah, we've got people that are, that are definitely better than me in a lot of things. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so I, I'll, I'll go back to, you know, some of that we talked about earlier about like scaling. And I think a lot of people, sure, there's, there's not very many, right? There's a handful of stories where people are able to scale really quick. But there's always like a certain component and that big one that people don't understand is it takes a lot of capital to do that. And so many people start a business with no money and they think, OK, I can just scale overnight. Hey, don't get me wrong. You can do it right. You can make it happen. You can turn some jobs. You can reload your cash and, and know that you're going to have to sacrifice yourself to kind of self fund your business. But th there is some truth to the reality of if you get too big too fast i've seen that happen guys oh. people scale too fast and they fall flat on their face because they don't have the financial backing and the financial you know cash flow management skills to to grow their business so if you're going to do that great talk to sam i can help you what there's a lot of people that are going to help you do that but you better be funded if not be very intentional and very strategic okay if you can go do a million or first year, two, three million or second, four, five, and you scale that way, you can do it properly and self-fund, 
but be careful trying to just go all in and scale super quick without that capital. Like my man spent a million dollars to scale <laughs> business to 10, to 10, uh, to 10 million in one year. Like that's, yeah. that's reality of it. I mean, that's real. Like we have to go, we have to go into the beginning of every year, like with well into the seven figures of literally cash just to be able to, to, to handle the growth and or handle the year, you know? Mm -hmm. 100%. I, can't tell you, I can't tell you how many roofing companies we've started here. Um, probably 40 or 50 anyways. And 50% of them left with a draw balance and they're going to start their own company. It's just sad. I mean, I, I want to help people. I want to, that's why I'm on the show, right? I want to share mm. knowledge with people. I, you, no matter how many times you tell people it's not going to work, it's just they, they don't seem to understand it. But mm -hmm. um, you're right with the intention. It's, it's possible. It's very doable. But you've got to be intentional about it. You've got to count. You got to know where your money is coming from. You got to know where your money's at. I talk at some of this, these events about accounting, um, and I'm super conservative now. Um, I've always have been. Even though you see these growth, you're like, "What do you mean? You're not conservative?" But because I know where the money's at, I know where our money's at. I'm counting for my money. I can produce uh, cash flow projections, you know, for the next three to four months on how much we're going to be getting um, on data that we're, we collect, but then that's, that's something that comes later, but even on a small scale, you can, you can project data, um, on a, on an Excel spreadsheet. You don't need a ton of technology. If you're, if you're self-funding and you're doing it, but you just got to be intentional. You got to be intentional about where your money's at and whether you're taking on too much, whether you're scaling too fast. Um, you get one shot at it. If you fail at it, you get a bad reputation. You don't pay a bill. You don't take care of a customer, right? because um, you ran out of cash or you're short on cash, it's um, it can become a problem. Mm -hmm. 100%. So, okay, so I, I feel like I'd be giving you a, a disservice if I didn't talk about company culture and branding, right? Everybody knows the, the Crest Hustle side of things. So, you know, how did that come about and how have you been able to make that stick to the way that it's had and kind of gain the popularity that it has? And we made it stick with tattoos. Um, I don't know if you know that story. I don't, I don't no, know. I don't know that story. No, let's, yeah, let's, yeah, let's dive in. Employees. Twelve of our employees have Crest Hustle tattoos on them. <laughs> um, I have one. I have one tattoo that says Crest Hustle. Um, and several of them, it was their first tattoo as well. Um, it started uh, October of 2016. I don't know why, when, or how. I mean, I know how it started. It started with a text message between me and Logan. Um, hashtags and Twitter was a thing. We were Facebook. Um, junkies, right? I Facebook like a ninth grade girl. Um, I think that was part of the attention, part of how you how you want to get your brand out there. A lot of what that cult, you know, people want to be proud of where they work. Um, they want to brag about they, they want they brag about their football team, right? They brag about the Cowboys. You brag about the Rangers, and you're not as involved there as you are at work. Like you want to build a team culture, a team uh, something they can root behind. Um, something that's not necessarily Crest Exteriors, it is Crest Hustle. It's an internal culture. It's something that we talk about. Um, we're vocal about it, right? We're vocal on Facebook about it. Um, I sent Logan a text one day and hashtagged it Crest Hustle. And uh, he replied back. He's like, I think that's a thing. Uh, we should trademark that. And literally the first time I texted it, he replied back because we should trademark it. And I've got it on the wall. I've got a federal trademark for it hanging on my wall right now. Um and then we just started hashtag and everything, everything was everything in a group, right? It was, we were rooting for a team. We were rooting for, for group wins, uh, for individuals. It, when you can get the team to root for each other, um, uh, and, and the, and the branding, it's, there's value there. Um, there's a, there's an internal culture. You want, you want, you know, the, the competitiveness of sales contests, but you also want, the support of a friend and, and, and people rooting for you. And uh, it just, it just works, man. We just started, uh, we all, we all root for each other every day in the office. If you walk in our office and someone asks how you're doing and you say good, you're going to get yelled at. Someone's going to be like, how do we go from good to great? Like we don't, we don't, we don't accept good, right? That's just not, it's not in our personality at Crest. So um, the whole culture thing is, is led by, by not only me, but Logan. I don't know y'all haven't had Logan on, but Logan, Logan's on Jake, just you show last week. Um, he's got his own brand now too. Logan slogans. Um, he's my business partner. We brought him in in 2016 and he's our, he's one of our cultural leader, leaders as well. But, um, so yeah, here's a, a interesting story for you. Like as, as that kind of was starting to become a thing, like there was part of like I saw that and I'm like, cause I was on the same notion of man, I, I got to turn my company into a media company and figure out what we can do. 
And, and ours kind of was somewhat influenced by that where we came up with the same type of thing with our company. It's, we did the hashtag elite team and then hashtag elite family. Mm-hmm. So like those that we created two of them and it's like elite team, elite family. Like we got them like stickers on people's cars and like our staff and like all. So we hashtag and use the same type of thing. And it, it's same type of concept. It's a great way to bring your team together, bring people together under one common, like, you know, cultural dynamic, you know, like we want to work as a team and we're a family, like we're one big family. And I yeah. think uh, that, that really helps trend, helps like bring all that together. Having it, it's weird, but a little, a little hashtag can bring a whole comp- a whole culture of a company together. A hundred percent. Okay. So, you know, now what I want to go into is, is a little bit of systems and processes, right? Repeatable systems and processes, one of the key components to figuring out how to actually scale this company. All right. And so I want both of you guys to so start with Sam, then we'll, we'll get hit to you up, Randy, right after. But, you know, people say systems, they say processes, they say how important it is, right? But they don't really go into like a deep dive, right? I want some examples. So if I get like an example from one of you guys or a, a one from each of you guys, maybe a marketing process you're proud of or a sales process you're, you're proud of or a production process something that you're like hey once we implemented this we were so stoked because we knew it was scalable right and we knew it was going to simplify our business organize our business and the, the day make us more successful so sam do you have an example of a process that you've been stoked about it's something that you put in or something you're working on now yeah we just we were oh, y'all still can't read my war board behind me that's my war board for 2021 january um, it's all processes that's all i work on um december and january we try to like Randy said earlier, break your process, um, find a better one. We just went through the hiring process. We have phase one, phase two, and phase three. We have phase one, phase two, and phase three of, of the training process. Phase one being we have the exact ads that we're going to put out. We split test them. We wrote two ads. Here's the ads for being a sales rep. We start testing them. Which one gets the most responses of what type of personnel? The next step, as the person that gets the ads replied to, replies back with a questionnaire and a personality test. And as those come back, we know how to categorize them, where they go in the office, what stack they go into, and who calls them next, right? Phase two. Phase two, we're going to do a Zoom interview with them. We're going to score them on the folder that it's in. We've got a scoring system on the folder. People that get past the the Zoom test get to our sales trainer recruiter. And in phase three, the interview process, we have the questions written out. We know exactly what we're asking for. We know what we're looking for in response so the hiring process has is is a process we know how we know how many reps we can get and how long it will take and how many you know how many replies we're going to get on an ad i if i need 20 reps tomorrow i know where to put ads how many ads to put out and how it's going to work once they're hired we have phase one training right the first videos they watch are almost 100 percent cultural based it's all about crest hustle we've got our crest rap songs we've got all those speaking engagements we get them bumped up phase one is um, has a lot to do with Crest and the history of Crest. It's a two-day process. Phase phase two, we teach them about how to get a lead, teach them about a 30-second commercial. Um, once we pitch them, show them how to learn a 30-second commercial, we can put them on the streets to get a lead. They get a lead before we put them into phase three. That's part of phase two is to go get some leads. And then we put them into phase three. But each one's got a phase. We dissected our process and said, hey, how do we make this better? How do we hire people? Right. Ask yourself questions. Um, write down the questions, and you can find a process for it. Mm-hmm. Thanks for sharing, Sam. I like that. What about you, Randy? Yeah, uh, I was, that's that's fantastic. Similar thing. I mean, when we scaled our business pretty heavily, we it was you know we have a, a, a interview, hire, process, onboard, train, like a systematic way of doing that. Sales is obviously key, but do that for like every position. Like we have a same type of thing for admin same type of thing for ar ap like you know the the in you know we, we have to pull we have a whole permitting department and process for how to hire and train people in each one of those departments but i i would say the key process you know outside of hiring is going to be uh, a, a job submission process the transition between sales and production I think if you can really dial in that process, you scale it up. So here, the, the, the hack, the best way to do that is first off, you got to create a checklist. Okay. What is all of the pieces of information that your production coordinator, your production manager needs in order to build that roof, right? You need contract, insurance, paperwork, uh, uh, pictures. You need, you know, all signatures and all colors. Like you need, a, you, our, our guys do their own material orders. Like, we have a step-by-step, like these are the eight things that you have to do 
every single time in order for us to produce that job. That process alone, if you can dial that in and be really rigid with it, that's how you scale your production. Okay, scaling sales is awesome, but if you don't have a production process in place, your production team is gonna flounder and you're gonna have a lot of trouble. So having that process to where now I'm a salesperson, I can hand over a job and go sell another roof. And that production person does not have to call me one time because they have all the information. That's the key process you got to have dialed in. Mm -hmm. Love it. So, guys, we're, we're going to take a, a quick. We got, we got them all. <laughs> we're, we got we're every, every position in the company. Boom. Yeah. Love it, man. Well, you guys are both crushing it, and the, the process is obviously that's why you guys are able to scale the way you have been. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to say a, thank, a quick thank you to our sponsors. After that, we're going to go into sales and marketing processes, and, and Sam can kind of talk about going into a, a different market. Uh, Randy can talk about having a local market. We're going to talk about developing you know, a commercial department, and then we have time after that, we're going to go into leadership development. So, you know, obviously, you guys but know by now our, our lead sponsors, our headline sponsor, Job Nimbus. Job Nimbus is a fully customizable back office solution. Track leads, jobs, tasks from one easy to use software. And with the largest ecosystem of integrated partners, if we don't do it, we have a friend who does. Learn about the number one back office system in roofing. We can help you be efficient, be organized, be professional, and be profitable. So if you guys have been watching the show for a while and somehow have not checked out Job Nimbus, our headline sponsor, make sure you go to info.jobnimbus.com backslash roofing dash academy. And up next, we got our friends over at Hail Trace. If you're in the hail game, if you're working hail claims and, and selling roofs that, are, that have hail damage, you need to know where the hail is, how big the hail is, and when it hailed. I mean, if you're on the fence, it's a game changer. So if you guys want to go check out Hail Trace, if you want to see what you can do for your company, if you want to check out the brand new website that it's got, which is awesome, go to HailTrace.com. And last but not least, Company Cam. Stop driving job site to job site or texting and emailing photos. Know what's happening across your business. Get started for free today. Now, if you want to get a Company Cam, for free to get started, right? Go to companycam.com backslash SBG show. Now, let's get back to the show and we're gonna talk about a very fun one because we're gonna get two different looks at this because we're gonna start with Sam. We're gonna go into, hey, we, if you have, you know, like Charles or something like that, there's a new storm, right? Uh, and how to market and sell appropriately at a new market, right? Versus Randy with you being just local and what you do when that storm hits, being in a local hail market. So Sam, start us out. What's what's the approach at a sales and marketing level? A storm hits. Um, how do you kind of prep for that? And make sure that you're ready to go to to maximize that opportunity. Uh, preparation's key, right? We got to have. Um, we keep our, our camper. We have a we have a fifty foot camper. We have trailers that are full of eight hundred number contracts, generic marketing material that doesn't tell them where we're from, right? All our yard signs will have eight hundred numbers. All our contracts will have eight hundred numbers with no address on them. We'll have 800 number of marketing material, everything ready to go get into a market. And I don't want to say incognito, not, not look like a storm chaser, right? I mean, to the extent that we can, we're, 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 we're chasing a storm. We showed up in back in, in, um, three, four this year at 8 AM. Um, the hailstorm happened at three in the morning. We had, we had 20 reps there at 8 AM and it's three hours away. We woke them all up out of bed at five o'clock. We were there knocking on doors. Um, literally when the sun was coming up, but we're, we're prepared before the, before we go into the storm, we already have our contracts. We know where we're going. We know what demographics we're looking at. Uh, when we go into a market, we know what kind of um, home count we're looking for. Um, the percentage um, of homes damaged in that home, home count before it's worth going in and cold marketing. Obviously anything where we've got an office, we can, we can work, but we go, we like to go in where the, the abundance of, of claims or, or homes that are going to be filed are beyond what the local contractor can handle. And we're going to get our overflow no matter what, right? Even if we're terrible, which we're not, but we go in and we go in hot and heavy. We go in on the doors. Um, we go talk to insurance agents, talk to real estate agents. We get on the phone, start looking for housing. We've got an entire checklist of what we do, right? Before we go, before we go into a storm, as soon as it hails, we've got a team that's going to start 
getting local phone numbers, getting an office set up. In the fr- in the back of that trailer is is furniture. It's it's towels. It's it's shower hangers for the apartments we're about to rent. As we unload the office, we've got the apartment right behind it, right? So we've got marketing material first, then we've got an office to unload, and then we've got a housing housing to house people. We can mobilize very quickly after a storm. And the, really, the key is, and LC used to say this, dude, he's um, Matt's guy. The, the first one to build wins the storm. So you want to get in, you want to get in there, you want to have a contest. Isn't necessarily who can sell the most, it's who can find the insurance paperwork with the job ready to build. And we want to build on day two um, after a storm. And we've done that. We've did that in Bossier. We did it in Dallas. We've done it in Denver. Um, and you break into neighborhoods, and then the word spreads. While these other contractors are telling them they're, you know, they're 10, 15, 20 days out before they can even inspect it, we're already nailing shingles on the roof. Um, speed to market is is key when you're going to a different market. I'm sure Randy's got better better advice in a in a home market because we do too. We work with both those as home markets, but in a storm market to us, it's getting on the doors, being the first one to build, um, being the first one in town. It's, it seems seems to work. You get enough traction. Mm-hmm. So is it pretty much, are you just doing a mostly like a sales approach where you're just knocking doors or do you try to complement that with, you know, any kind of marketing as well? Uh, or- we'll, we'll be on digitally quick, but it takes a minute, right? So mm-hmm. usually, usually the digital footprint isn't as fast as a door. So mm-hmm. we'll be digitally printing that area um, with Facebook ads, right? Mm-hmm. Facebook ads are easy. They don't convert as well. Um, pay-per-click ads, we can get in. We got to to we just redesigned our website today. We're, we're, we're rolling into a new a new website platform where we can control that a lot quicker. Um, and we're going to be able to c- control that a little faster. But typically, we're, we're going straight into the sales process. We do hit mailers. We've got 800 number mailers made up, ready to mail. We've got 800 number door hangers. We've got digital campaigns that we run there. But the first the first two weeks of the storm isn't about digital. Those people, the, it's about getting on a door. Direct marketing is, is going to win a storm. Mm-hmm. You can digital market later, but direct marketing is those the people that are going to buy at the door. You can put all the Facebook ads you want over top of their house. If I'm knocking on their door, I'm selling the roof before you are. Mm-hmm. So speed to market matters. Um, now, for longevity of a storm, correct. Digital marketing is important to keep keep the faucet going, um, but you got to get there and you got to go turn it on yourself. You can't just throw Facebook ads up and wait for the phone to ring. Mm-hmm. You could, I guess, but. <laughs> so I like that. So that, you know, it's really cool because now we're, we're looking at you. Know, we're, we're trying to help out people in all different areas, right, of the country with all different types of business models, right? So obviously with Sam, you, you know, you have the capabilities to go out when there is a new storm. Rand, you decided to go a different route, right? You say, hey, I'm just going to be here. I'm going to dominate my local market, and that's what I want to do. So now when a storm hits in, in just Denver or the local area, right, what what's the, the key to be maxing that out if you're just staying home and you're maxing out your storm? Yeah, so both, I'm from I, I'm cut from both cloths as well, right? When I was selling roofs, that's what I was doing is you know chasing storms, <laughs> setting up storms, trying to get there quickly, kind of in that world. Um, selfishly for me, I just didn't want to travel anymore. I didn't want to have to uproot myself and go live somewhere for six months at a time. That's just me personally. I didn't want to do that. So I was like, okay, how can I figure out what to do and how to just hunker down and, and stay focused in one area? And I'm from Colorado. I grew up here. I went to high school here. I have friends here, family. I went to college here. Like I'm very rooted in this in this market. So it just made sense for me to stay. All right, and it's a and it's a hail market. It's traditionally going to get hailed just about every single year. So in that sense, to get started, you got to be the first. It's it's speed to market. But for longevity, you know, we work all year long networking and and connecting with the right people and the right you know insurance agents and realtors and property managers and commercial like all the people that are local that we can connect and network with all year long and the second a storm hits we go straight to the field but over time what has happened is before we ever even get a chance to knock on a door our phones blow up Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. guys are already in the field if, it, if they don't have a call already, great. They're on the doors doing whatever they can. But nine times out of ten, their their phones are blowing up. Our friends are blowing up because we have such a solid footprint in our local market. But that takes years in in residual in consistently and invest consistency and in investing in home shows and you know ne- you know insurance 
uh, uh, agencies and networking groups and all the things that we do year round to lay that footprint. Um, there, there's a there's a network and there's a you can win in both situations. So if you do want to travel, great. You need to have a plan in place to be able to execute quickly. If you want to be local and dominate your local market, you have to work right now when it's cold and snowy out to build those relationships and continually doing that in order to set yourself up to be successful when the storm happens. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. so, that, so now we got two different business models, right? And they're both crushing it. And now you can kind of get an idea of which one you know, you're in and then what to do to make sure that you're successful in it. Now, Sam, so the, the commercial side of things, right? So what's your split in terms of revenue of residential versus commercial when we first start? Then I'm going to ask you some more follow-up questions from there. Uh, we're probably 70% residential, 30% commercial. Mm -hmm. And then what's your commercial approach? Do you, is it is it mostly retail type stuff? Is it more store? Like what's kind of your your, your bread and butter there? It's all retail. They're, they're, they're basically completely different businesses. Mm -hmm. The residential side is 99% restoration work, insurance work. Our commercial side is 90% um, capital improvement work. Um, whether it's storm damage or not, it's typically budgeted work. It's um, it, we, we do a lot of multifamily, not necessarily. Some people define them different, commercial versus multifamily. We don't do a lot of industrial. We do a lot mm -hmm. of uh, multifamily pitched and flat uh, and tile. But uh, we do carpentry and paints. We do screens. We do uh, parking lot striping. We do a lot of capital improvement projects for our, cust our commercial customers. It's all relationship-based. Um, almost none of it came through like a digital marketing platform. We digital market to them. Don't get me wrong. We Once we know them, we footprint them and we they know who Crest is. We stay in, we stay on top of them. But so it's in a reverse order. We meet them first and then we stick it on top of them. So that they mm -hmm. take our brand. We we uh we go to trade shows, we work relationships. Um the cycle's a lot longer. Um mm -hmm. but it's been very fruitful so far. We're expecting twenty twenty one to to blow the doors off of it um again. So each year we're getting you know, one to two major customers. One major customer can give you $10 million in, in business. So we've got two right now that are giving us a lot. They're, they're hopefully going to give us $10 million just, just this year in business with two customers. Um, mm -hmm. And it's profitable. But it's profitable work when it's relationship work. It's not um, hoard out. It's not like government bid work where you're just like, you know. Yeah, we're, we're doing hard. well with it. We're... Uh, we we fly under the radar there where, where we need to. We've got our we've got our customers, but we we, we went after them intentionally. We chose our customers there, um, and went after them, worked for them, earned the business, and we we feed them. We just like in the real estate agent, right? These guys want attention. They're going to give business to who they get attention from, yeah. and uh, we farm it. Um, very very similar, just to, uh, you know, a more fine tuned scale where we go after insurance agents and other agents like you talked about earlier, Randy, um, year round consistency, but we go after, you know, a shotgun approach. We go after a lot of them a lot of times where in the multifamily space, we go after a smaller group pretty intensely. And mm -hmm. it's worked out well for us. Yeah. So what's your commercial like strategy, I guess, in terms of where are you willing to work and take projects and stuff like that? I'm licensed in 26 states, so I can uh, I can take projects pretty much anywhere. Commercially roofing, we travel very well. Um, you know, most roofing crews uh, will travel for apartment complex jobs for you know month long projects, six month projects. Um, we've got crews traveling up to Denver right now. I know Randy's up in Denver. We're doing a big one. Um, sometimes we we send. We've got local crews. Sometimes we send Texas crews. Sometimes we just depends on the type of product and the type of stuff. But geographically for roofing, if I'm licensed, I'll roof it. I don't really care where it's at. Mm. So then uh, what tips do you guys have? And I'll move on here, both you guys. I'll start with you, Randy, and then we'll kind of go from there for people who are looking to develop this, you know, commercial department. Because I, for me, you know, we talk to, you know, roofing companies all, all over, right? And a lot of people are in the residential space. They're getting traction. They're doing well there. But, you know, everybody wants to get into commercial, right? I mean, this is the way it is. So, Randy, what, what advice do you have for somebody who's like, Randy, man, I really want to commercial. I don't know what the heck to do. <laughs> well, I think that you nailed it with the relationship piece. And so many people want to just go catch a whale and, and catch that, that apartment complex as their first deal and just get that major deal. And 
you're not just going to do that. You're not just going to go from zero to hero and just get up your first at bat and hit a home run. So you got to focus on the relationship and figure out what you can do to nurture that relationship. And the, for me, the path of least resistance is service work. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we do so much service work for so many different property management companies and, and ownership groups that, I mean, we're, we're two years now in our market. We haven't had hardly any storms, but like we've grown our footprint to a point where like, I'm almost scared of what's going to happen when we get a storm because we have so many people that we've built relationships. We've done those thousand dollar, two thousand dollar, fifteen hundred, five hundred dollar repairs, leak repairs, inspections. We've done so many of those and built so many relationships. Again, take we have a golf, we do golf tournaments, we do golf me- things, we do sporting events, and take these people and build these relationships and, and take care of them. You know, all knowing that hey, when the right opportunity presents itself, we're going to be on the short list of those phone calls. So I don't think people realize that that you know we. You know, Jonathan talks about too, like hurry up and wait. Like it's it's a long process. I mean, you may start a relationship right now and you may not get a roof for two years from that person. Oh right? you sure. just got a <laughs> you got an opportunity to do a roof <clears throat> like a massive multi-million dollar project down in Telluride through two years of networking with the same group of people. Yeah. We do with with the service clients I'm talking about on multifamily, we probably average two hundred POs per roof of just dumb shit. I mean, we were talking to install a flagpole, right? My gate's broken. We need, there's a stair step that's broken. The, the, do y'all, do y'all, can y'all do handrails? And we help them out with just about any trade out there because we know the next guy that does do the, you know, the services that, that provides the, the maintenance and service that they require is going to get the opportunity at the roof. Very few people are going to step in and just grab that big, that big roof without doing service contracts. Right? Yeah. And focus on your credibility too, because in like online credibility, I mean, if you could try to walk into a, you know, million dollar project, you better believe whoever the, whoever's making that decision is going to look you up and try to research you. And if you don't exist and if you're, there's, you're not showing, you have three reviews and, and uh, you know, you, you, your website is, is built by a trained monkey in, in Japan. Like it's not going to work. Like you got to make sure you have a good footprint and a good, online presence good reviews like good uh, examples and case studies and and that's the hard part that's hard to get like when we show up to someone's office like we have pages and pages of here's here's credibility here's resources here's projects we've done here's examples here's customers here's all these things that we can show that we can prove that we can handle this sort of project and it takes time to get there so you got to document everything and build up that credibility and or referral portfolio and that'll help you out a lot as well Mm-hmm. And, you know, we got uh, some comments that, you know, we were just kind of deep in conversation that I didn't go through. But, you know, we had Nathan Ellis on here uh, with, with Pinnacle out here in Denver. He's saying, what's up, fellas? Uh, we have, you know, Ray's on here. She's with Integrity Pro also out here. We have Jonathan Sherwood. Sounds like he's out in Nebraska jumping on some roofs. Uh, we got Blake out in Dallas Fort Worth. He's on here. And then we got the man, the legend, John Dye saying, what up? But then we also we got we got a request too. So I mean, this is really going to be uh, up to Sam. But we said Sebastian says, Sam, can you share your pitch at the door on a fresh storm? So I, I, I do we get some live action role play here? Yeah, do we need a knock on the door? Yeah. I, I wish I, I wish I could. It's been a minute since I've been on the door, brother. Uh, <laughs> I can I can put you in I can put you in place with our training, bro. We get you on the door. Oh, uh, Tiger, Tiger's uh. Tiger came in though, no, for real. We 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 work on that, but um, I don't work on it as much anymore. Um, <laughs> you guys, you we, think we think that's one of the most important things to train, right? That's that is something you should always have ready. Uh, yeah. Tells you, you should have your thirty second commercial. Uh, yeah. We call it your thirty second commercial. You should. We don't. I don't even like. I'll tell you another secret. I don't even like knocking on doors. I like I like sitting at a gas station with a wristband, walking up to every person with our with our Crest Hustle bands, and stick it out. 100% of the time, that person will stick their hand through. I don't care if it's a police officer, if it's the president, if Chuck Norris, anybody will. I got Gary V with it four times. I've gotten Carter <laughs> twice. I've gotten Jamon Bettis. I've got, we have, a, we have a hit list of who we're going to put these Crest Hustle bands on there. Every one of them will do it. My phone <laughs> number and my website are on the inside of them. There it is. So there it is. What yeah. they do is go, what is that? You should, you should get it. Hey, Rapid Bands makes them. You can get your website and your phone number put on the inside. Nice. It's on somebody. The first thing they do is go, "What is this?" 
and you give me a 30 second commercial. Hey, I'm Sam. I do uh, insurance restoration work. You live around here? Yeah. Always end every question, every sentence with a question. They're going to start talking to you. Always ask them what their last experience was like with the contractor because they're going to tell you it was bad. No matter what, people like bashing other people. You don't have to do it for them. So you you go to you go up to them. You, you introduce yourself. Hey, I'm in, I'm Sam. I do insurance restoration work. Do you live around here? Yeah, I do. Oh, there was a recent storm. What was? Did y'all get damaged? Yeah. What was your last experience like with a contractor? They'll tell you a bad story. Tell them how you can solve their problem. That's the pitch. As long as you're solving the problem they explain to you, they'll tell you how they want to be sold. If you ask them the right question, they're going to tell you what they're buying, right? How was, how was, the, how was your experience last Monday? He was terrible. He was always late. Well, that's not how we're like. At Crest Six Years, we're always on time. You just they're going to they're going to explain to you if you get it, get them engaged, get them outside the house, get them talking, and ask them about experiences they've had in life. They'll tell you what they want to buy every time. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, Sebastian said solid. So it looks like, you know, he got what he wanted with the question. Now, Camelotic Series says, do you get a service contract for commercial properties? Service contract, but maintenance services, we do not. Mm -hmm. We have a we have an agreed price with them on services that we do. So they do have a price list they request from us. And we give them a price list for service calls, a price list for, you know, simple, simple routine stuff as far as repairs. But uh, I don't typically, I don't have anybody under contract for a maintenance package at the moment. We've mm -hmm. had one roof in, in five years where we, we charged a maintenance contract of like six cents a square foot to, to inspect the roof and clean it once a year. Um, yeah. Property management company switched and we no longer service that property. That's based on the client. I mean, you, you don't want to try to just open with, hey, give me money and, to, to, and I'll come service you, your, your roof. It works better after you finish. After the, the fact. Yeah. After you, you build a roof, the roof. If you're doing a flat roof specifically or you're, you're seeing a potential problem, we're doing the, a conference center right now with um, some Yankee gutter systems on it that we're in our, in our pitch to sell the roof we're including a maintenance package to keep the gutter system clear. Mm -hmm. There's no way to put guards on a Yankee gutter in the scenario that we're working on. So we're saying, here's the cost for your roof. Here's what it costs us to come back once a year to maintain the warranty on your roof. Um, we've got the contract. We went through phase one of the build in January of last year and COVID happened. It's a huge Marriott here. So they're stopping production until COVID. Yeah. I don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Hold yeah. So on that note, like I would rather go in and do whatever I can to prove my value first. Okay. Same type of conversation you were just talking about. Like you can talk, go into a commercial <laughs> setting and ask them, Hey, what was your last experience with a roofer? Like what's your biggest challenge you've had with a contractor? And they're going to spit a whole bunch of things at you. They're going to tell you everything you need to know to then come in and solve their problem. You know, do you have any problems right now that I can go look at and try to solve for you? What's your worst challenge? What's your worst leak? What's your worst problem you have right now? Let me see. Let me go take a look at it and I'll see what I can do to, to fix that. And then you get in. There's certain cases where we'll, I mean, I'll even let the guys do like, if it's a minor something, do it for free. Just let them know that we can help them out and we, we have the capacity in-house service. We can do it and we can, we can solve their problems. And you build that relationship up without trying to say, hey, give me money up front and I'll do a service contract. After you build that relationship and it comes up, great. If they're willing to do that, by all means, you can do that, but we don't we don't build a whole model around that. We just want to provide as much service and build a relationship any way we can. We want to become like the short list. Anytime you have a problem with your roof, we're your short list. You call us and we're out there right away to fix it for you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into to one more question. And then after that, Sam, I'm going to give you a heads up. Well, I always end it with a golden nugget. The last thing you want to leave the viewers with that they can implement in their business, things that you've noticed in the industry that they, they, they shouldn't do, whatever it might be. One last little tip. It's a little golden nugget. But be, you know, before we dive in, I do want to touch on leadership development because if we're talking about scalability, you can only manage so many people yourself, right? As you scale, you can't be managing everybody. So what do you do to you know either find good leaders or make sure that you're developing great leaders uh to make sure that you you're developing the best possible business you can uh what are you doing on that end of things i wish i was doing more um, <laughs> the, the hardest person to find is a leader in this space um not all good sales guys are good leaders um not all good leaders are good sales guys they don't need to be um they need to know process they need to know how to how to lead men they need to know how to communicate clearly um for example we had a a chain in a group me a second ago where a line of communication came from one of my one of my managers um, to a 
to a group of, of other managers actually. But um, the communication came off. Just the way you word things is, is oftentimes um, just as important as the message, specifically through text. It's difficult to read tone through text. Uh, we like to sandwich our communication. We like to do do things um, as far as leadership. When we bring a team together and bring a sales meeting together, we I can't tell them all my secrets, but I'm going to. Um, we like to bring the ideas up as a group think, even though even if we have an idea of what we want the end result to be, right? We want the end result to be, hey, we should send out a satisfactory letter and get them signed, right? By every customer saying they're satisfied before we pay cap outs. You can make that. The, the team's idea through leadership, right? You can you can drive the conversation, make it their ideas. I think what we train most in our leadership is communication and how they communicate to the team and how they um, can get the most juice out of the squeeze, right? Um, you Not every sales rep will reach their potential. Instead of having 200 sales rep, I'd rather have 100 that I'm getting 100% out of, right? It's less liability. It's less iPads I got to buy. It's less emails I got to pay for. So a lot of the focus on leadership is about getting more out of people by asking that correctly. A lot of the power of words is powerful, right? What almost everything we do in today, or, or the reason you're having this show is because people are listening to words. How you communicate and how you communicate through leadership, through through getting people to follow you by what you say, is a skill set, and it, we're we're good at training that to our managers on how to get the team to respond by saying what you you know what these words there's there's just different there's different examples there but mm -hmm. i think there's a lot of psychology in sales there's a lot, a lot of psychology in in roofing and, and leadership to get all together the mm -hmm. whole field process the whole objection these are objection cards i'm holding but um the objection lists the, the the whole pitch all of its psychology right how you drive and i think that i think that has a lot to do with management mm -hmm. That's probably, you know, i'm sure randy might have a different one but, yep communication yeah, no, that's good stuff I think communication is obviously the foundation of that stuff, you know, for our perspective, like, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent and I study leadership quite a bit and, and everything in your business, everything in life rises and falls on leadership. You know, you can only go as far as your leadership will take you. And I think, you know, we have to embrace the idea as leaders. Our responsibility is to develop other leaders. You know, we have to take ownership of if we can develop other people to be to become leaders, we all grow. That's my job as a CEO and as a leader of my company. And one of the key rules that we have that we really implement in our business is leadership through empowerment. You know, we want to include people in decisions. We want to empower them to make decisions, empower them to take ownership of whatever it is that they're leading, whoever it is they're leading. If they're leading a production team, a supplementing team, a sales team, a marketing team, whatever it is, Take ownership of that and 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 understand your role. Uh, and we like to empower them to to make decisions and and really take ownership of their role from a leadership perspective. But here's a piece of advice that that you know my mentor gave me in the, when it comes to leadership, and it really makes a lot of sense. And and the first piece is you want to you want to be always supportive. Okay, as a leader, always be supportive. You also want to be slightly detached. That's key. I think in our business, too many leaders. Too many owners try to be like best friend, buddy, buddy, let's go to the bar together with all their people. And I think that's that's the wrong way to approach and and, and to be a great leader is you kind of got to lead by example. And when everybody else is at the bar, I'm going to be at home with my family or, or, or working on my business. You know what I mean? Uh, so always supportive, slightly detached and always, always equal. Mm, right? I love Great that. People equal. We, we all have. We're all equal, but we just have different roles and different responsibilities. So like that, that's that's mm -hmm. the role, uh, my mentor. Me and my, me and my partner preach that, that we work for them. I mean, I get up every day because I work for a hundred people, right? I, leadership. I have the drive. Yeah, I have a drive to get up here, and I don't have a choice. I've got a hundred people I work for, right? Yeah. And it's it's not the other way around. I don't think anybody works for me, right? I yeah, I feel like I come up here every day to. And that's what that's how we built our. That's probably what you buy here. I like to build a system. That's better than where I came from. I sold for a different company that didn't have a system. I, I built, I built and designed all the processes. A lot of times, cutting stuff. Half the time, I design a process. I'm like, how, how do I make this simpler for a sales mm -hmm. rep? How do I take a step away from a rep? Like, yeah. how do I make this sales process easier for them? Like, that's because I want, I want to work 
for them and towards their success. And the less I can put on them, the more time they can spend selling, the more successful they're going to be. That's a great, that's great advice though. I, I, I agree completely on your leadership um, take there. The detached part. So that's, that's a tough one, you know, because yeah. especially most of us, when we start, we bring all of our family and closest yeah. people to come help us and which is great, but there's a certain tipping point where you got to understand that yes, your buddies on, on the weekends or camping or whatever, but this is still a business and I still have to own, I still have to own my role as a leader and you still have to perform as a subordinate. Like that's just the reality of it. And, and we can't, we don't, don't get that twisted because you've got to have that, those lines established in order to, uh, yeah. you know, really have a clean leadership team and grow your business the right way. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's not easy. No, Sam, it's been awesome having you on. We re really appreciate you joining us on the, on the Start, Build, Grow show. But, you know, before we close it out, we always do the golden nugget, man. You know, I made Randy do 133 golden nuggets and I'm gonna make him do another one. Now, but Sam, man, what, what do you want to leave the viewers with, you know, after you, you're nice enough to kind of share a bunch of tips already? Oh, man. What is a golden nugget? <laughs> I like the 30 second commercial, man. I think, I think you've got to train it. You've got to, you've got to get them to repeat it. You got to get them to memorize it. They've got to always know a pitch. You never know when your next deal is going to come from. It's coming from the, we sold 400 roofs at Kroger. No shit. I hired a guy. He was with us for a month. He knew his 30 second commercial. He went inside of Kroger. Some guy walked up to him. was like, Hey, was that you in the roofing truck? Yes. Here's what we do. Spits it to him. Guy goes, Hey, I got 400 roofs. I need to get done. And it was, we, he gave us all 400. We were 400 roofs last December because of a 30 second commercial. The guy wouldn't sell them for us for a month, but he was able to communicate with them what Crest Exteriors does and how we help customers through insurance. And you sold it at a grocery store while, while you're trying to buy coffee in the morning. Um, you're you're going to do more deals in a gas station, in a bakery, in a, in a grocery store while you're standing in line. You spend way more time doing that. You're doing that stuff anyway. You're already standing in line. You're already at the gas station. Why not be selling when you're there instead of out on the streets, knocking doors? You're not sure anybody's behind. Somebody's standing in front of you in line. Give them your 30-second commercial because you know they're going to answer. Instead, you're going to knock on 100 doors to get somebody to answer a door when there's someone standing in front and behind you in line at the grocery store. I don't know. My, my, my advice is do less door knocking and more 30-second commercials. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well said, my friend. Okay. Rands, what you got, man? Let's close this bad boy out. Man, I almost actually maybe even prepared a little bit for this one today. I gotta <laughs> think about it. Um, you know, but one of the things, and usually when I'm doing this, I, I think about kind of what am I thinking about, what am I working on throughout the day, you know, as I'm as I'm trying to coach and mentor people all day long. Uh, but one of the things that really resonated with me that actually kind of I'm just relaying some 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 something that uh, a mentor of mine mentioned me this morning was, you know, your added something about your attitude, right? Your attitude will determine your altitude. The, the, if you have the right attitude in place, that's what's gonna determine how far and how high you go in life. So, so it's all about attitude. Wake up tomorrow and have the right attitude. And, and if you will it, if you will things to happen and you have the right attitude and right mental preparedness, you're gonna make things happen and that'll determine your altitude. Love it, man. Great way to end it. Sam, it's been a pleasure to, to have you on the show, episode 134 of the Start, Build, Grow show. As always, everybody out there, we appreciate you tuning in. If you ever got questions, make, your, make sure you're hopping on the live, asking the questions, right? We're going to continue to bring some of the best guests. We got another one that's in the top 100 next week, so we're going to keep them coming for you guys. We're going to take the, the, the tour. Roofing. We got Antis Roofing on next week, man, out, oh, out in California, man. So we're going to keep them coming. We're going to yeah. take the people that are actually out there doing it, making it happen, and we're going to make sure that they give away all the secret sauce. So keep it. Make sure you're tuning in. Thanks for joining us on episode 134 of the Start, Build, Grow show. Take care.